Uh, hello everyone, my name is Shalyn McCoy and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, I just want to say welcome to today's webinar and also thank you for the Government of Canada for uh, contributing and, and helping us make this possible. Uh, for today's webinar, uh, we're really pleased to be hosting Dr. Anton Sullivan. Uh, he is a postdoctoral fellow in forestry and environmental management at the University of New Brunswick. Uh, there, his main research focus has been on linking landscape structure and composition to the spatial temporal variability of river thermal and flow regimes, forest hydrology and remote sensing. Uh, he also is co-pi of UNB's interactions in tomorrow's environmental laboratory, where he leads the airborne remote sensing unit. He also leads projects in eco hydraulics, ecology, ecophysiology of salmonids and precision farming, as well as collaborating on groundwater projects. Uh, to date, Anton has published 19 papers, but several more in review. Uh, today, he's going to be speaking on the topic of best practices for collecting thermal infrared images in rivers and the dynamics of behavioral thermal regulations of thresholds of juvenile Atlantic salmon. Uh, of course, after the presentation, I uh, will allow for questions and answers. But for now, I'd like to turn it over to Antone. Uh, I don't see his camera on right now. Antone, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I was just uh, just going to turn it off while. So you, if I turn my camera off, you can't see my screen, no? I can see you and your screen right now. OK, and if I turn my camera off, does that you don't want to see my face on the screen? That's kind of what I'm getting at here. So. <laughs> I still see your presentation. You're good. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. So I'll turn my camera off so we just have the screen then. All right. You're good to go. It's all yours. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks very much, Charlene. All right. Well, um, uh, thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to minimize this here and see if I can get my notes out. Sorry a second. Bear with me. Um, all right. So um, thanks very much to the ASCF and, and Charlene for the opportunity to present here. Um, I think people are going to get sick of seeing me on this thing. I, I started it and I guess I'm bookending it uh, in, the, in the spring. So uh, I apologize, I suppose. But hopefully some of this stuff is, uh, is of interest to folk. OK, so um, I'm going to talk about best practices for collecting thermal infrared imagery uh, in rivers and then speak about some of the um, some of the work we've done recently um, in our lab. So myself, uh, Tommy Linnisari, uh, my postdoctoral supervisor and I have um, I've been working on this idea that um, the the aggregation onset thresholds for for juvenile salmon par are not static, rather they they are dynamic and they're reflective of the the river environment or the thermal regime of the river uh, that the par are in. So it's kind of a, a overview of what we're going to speak about. Okay, and this doesn't want to. Okay, very good. Okay, so uh, for part one, then um, we'll speak about an overview of thermal infrared. So we'll speak about uh, just the the TIR work we've been doing uh, lately and some of our findings from last summer. Uh, and then we'll speak about this the role of absorptivity on the accuracy of temperature measurements. So this is probably going to be a bit a bit nuanced for folk, but uh, hopefully I can make it as simple as possible. If my brain can understand it, I'm hoping your guys can too. Um, and then speak about the light, uh, the role of light, excuse me, on the accuracy of temperature measurements. And this is all, of course, river temperature we're talking about here. Uh, and then part two then kind of change gears a bit. Um, we're going to speak about behavioral thermoregulation of uh, juvenile salmon par, excuse me, juvenile salmon, Atlantic salmon. And then uh, this idea of thermal hysteria, um, just what this means, what is, what, what is hysteresis, and then how we can apply it uh, to um, thermoregulation in juvenile Atlantic salmon. Okay, so this is uh, just if we think about scale here for a moment, and um, if we have on the y-axis fine scale, uh, this is a spatial scale, excuse me, so fine spatial scale and coarse spatial scale, and on the x-axis if, if we have cost, that could be whatever currency you're using, and if we think about now that we want to measure river temperature. So there's a couple of different ways we can go about this. Uh, we can launch a satellite into space at very high cost, and, and the resolution of the data is quite coarse. And um, when I mean coarse, I mean um, for every pixel, uh, it, it's it's going to be above uh, for thermal infrared, above like 30 meter resolution, maybe. Um, then we can, of course, come down in cost um, and, and look at things at the riverscape scale. So mounting a uh, thermal infrared sensor on a helicopter uh, it's still quite costly, though, um, but you get some phenomenal data from it. What we're seeing more and more now 
is this very fine scale, uh, fine scale studies, excuse me, using um, drones. And this is really relatively low cost in, in this matrix here. Um, and how they work is they have a, an uncooled microbolometer in them. So what does that mean? So there's simply elements here. And as this element, uh, as long wave infrared radiation hits off the element, it causes it to heat and it changes the electrical resistance of the sensor. And it's this electrical resistance, there's a, a proportion between electrical resistivity and, and temperature, you can back calculate the temperature uh, from this. So this is how they're working. Um, the, the key here is that these are uncooled sensors. So if you change the thermal conductance in the sensor, that's gonna change the electrical resistivity and it's gonna change the accuracy of the sensor. So that's what we're gonna come back to uh, later on in the presentation. Okay, and why is this important? Well, you can see if you, uh, this is um, from a, a quick search on, um, well, I can't remember what database it is, but if you type the words in UAV plus thermal image or thermal sensor, uh, you can see there's a, a really <laughs> high increase in the number of publications uh, across time. Really picks up here in 2017 and it's, it's been growing ever since. Okay, so before we go down the wormhole here, just to, so everyone's in the same kind of um, playing field, what are we talking about in terms of energy? So if we think about the sunlight, so we the sun is giving a shortwave, shortwave radiation. Uh, this is passing through the atmosphere, and this is where most of the Earth's energy is coming from. So it's coming from the sun. So when the uh, shortwave infrared radiation, so that's SW, um, it, when it hits off an object, it undergoes a couple of things. So mostly it's absorption. So absorption is simply the process of absorbing light, um, and some of it's reflected. And the reflected light is long wave infrared radiation. So of course you have many iterations then, so you may have, you can see my cursor here, you may have light reflected off the surface as long wave infrared, and then it may be absorbed somewhere else. And you have this iterative process of reflection, absorption, transmission of uh, solar, solar energy uh, throughout the entire planet. Uh, and then it can get even more complicated with the feedbacks, right? So this isn't to overwhelm people, uh, it's just to show like how complex these things are. Um, the main point to this though is that it's the re-radiated energy or that long wave infrared radiation is what the sensor is going to be measuring, is what that thermal sensor, that microbolometer is going to be measuring, all right? So really neat paper, uh, one of the first actually to kind of assess how accurate these uh, uh, drone-based thermal infrared sensors could be uh, for quantifying river temperature. And this is by Steve Dugdale, who's done, uh, he did his PhD here in, in Canada and did a postdoc here at UMB, uh, but he's done, he's kind of like, the guy for thermal infrared imagery. And they published this lovely paper back in uh, 2019. So what they what they did was they looked at a stream in Scotland in Baddock Burn, and then in another area in, uh, in Syracuse, uh, upstate New York. And what they found is quite interesting. So uh, if we look at this graph here, we've got temperature on the y-axis and distance of the stream on the, on the x-axis. They, they did 10 different flights. And here is the the uh, um, radiant temperature. So this is what the what the sensor is measuring on the drone. And, and this is what in-stream temperature loggers are saying. So there's there's quite a bit of variance and it's not it's not stable, right? So what is driving this variance? Um, the main point for this, I suppose, is their key findings. They found that these sensors can have large thermal uh, drift, that these were good at delineating river, relative river temperature differences, so that's important. Um, but they were poor for accurate temperature measurements. Uh, and and they, they, they found a couple of things here. Uh, environment was a big control of it. Also, they suggested that the internal heating of the sensor itself uh, was, was, was the reason for thermal drift. And they also had this suggestion uh, in the paper, which I, which I found interesting. It was that the suggestion of flying the drone um, during overcast conditions would limit heating of the sensor, which makes sense, and thereby uh, it would lead to more accurate temper temperature measurements. However, we have to think about the sensors for a moment. Um, a thermal infrared sensor is passive. So that means that it's measuring reflected energy back. So um, if we think about it in terms of a sonar system um, or a fish finder, if you're fishing, that's sending, it's an act, that's an active sensor. It's sending out an energy pulse and then it's coming back and it can, it can measure um, whatever the metric it's looking at via that reflection of the energy that it's, that it's, that it's emitted. But for passive sensors, it's, it, they behave like humans' eyes. They're, they're measuring the reflected energy off an object. So this is something we can come back to in a bit. Okay, so this is then a, a paper that I published with my mate, um, Barrett Kerlick. Um, Barrett's a prof at, um, at Dalhousie. He's quite a, quite a brilliant man. And 
Uh, he wouldn't like me saying that, but he is. Um, so this is a pretty pretty neat project that him and I have worked on uh, this past summer. Um, so what what are we talking about here with this paper? Well, we had a couple of conceptualizations or we things that we thought would happen um, if we, for instance, change the surface absorptivity um, of an uncooled sensor, and this would lead to a, a reduction in thermal drift um, by limiting how much absorption and thereby uh, microbrometer heating there is. I'm going to come back to this. It's quite wordy, but I've got some illustrations that I hope will will uh, kind of bring everyone in, into the same uh, realm here. And then the secondary one was that since these thermal infrared sensors are passive, that overcast conditions would actually decrease the signal to noise ratio because less long wave infrared radiation would reach the sensor. And this would actually lead to greater thermal drift. So rather than it reducing the the um, the errors of the temperature measurements, uh, like was suggested in that 28, 2019 paper, uh, we kind of think it may be something different. It may be the opposite of that, actually, when you take into account the physics of the sensor. So what am I talking about absorptivity of the of the surface here? So these are black, right? This is this is your bog standard uh, Zemu X T2 thermal sensor. They're black. So if you think about this, if it's a black object, that's going to absorb much more heat energy than say if we put tin foil, and this is just a, a Canadian tire um, um, HVAC aluminum foil that we wrapped around at five bucks. So it's not expensive to do this. So we could just wrap this, this foil around it and you would change the amount of absorptivity and reflectance. And therefore you hypothetically or conceptually, uh, you would change the heat energy balance or the amount of heat being um, absorbed by the sensor. And that should stabilize the thermal drift. So that was the thinking behind it. So to test this, uh, we went to the Nashwalk River uh, in New Brunswick. If anyone's familiar with it, it's kind of central New Brunswick and, and a place called Ryan Brook. Uh, Ryan Brook is a very steeply incised valley in a in a hyper fractured bedrock. So it's it's really nice at that site because you have this diffuse groundwater input um, in the tributary, which presents as a as a, uh, a discrete input in the main river here. So we have this lovely juxtaposition of groundwater and surface water dominance. So a very nice thermal gradient here. Uh, we put in 13, um, or excuse me, 12, 12, excuse me, um, uh, water temperature loggers in this grid here. We also had a light logger, and then we had air temperature logger here as well. Uh, the light logger was left on a rock, exposed, and that way we could measure light intensity as a proxy for uh, shortwave infrared, uh, uh, shortwave infrared radiation, excuse me, okay. Uh, and then, of course, we start just flying a bunch of drones, um, paths around it. So we had the same pathway every time. Um, so it was uh, apples. We were comparing apples and apples in essence. So we ended up doing 11 flights for the shielded sensor and 11 flights for the unshielded sensor. And we did these right after, so one after the other. So the light conditions and the air temperature were relatively similar. All right. So in terms of light, then, I'm just going to take a hit of coffee here. Sorry. So on June 27th, um, this is past summer, uh, we flew and it was this, this was the overcast condition we were looking at. Uh, June 29th, very clear sky condition. And then June 30th was a kind of a mixture between both. So this is nice here because we have a differential of um, cloud conditions. So it's going to change our short wave infrared radiation loading, uh, long wave infrared radiation loading. So we can ask some questions here for the light condition question. And if we look at it here in terms of what we were measuring, so the, the blue um, dots are going to be 27th of June, um, the gray dots 29th, and the, and the yellow dots will be the 30th of June. So if you look at air temperature, this is the range of air temperature we had uh, over the, the period that we were looking at. Uh, and here is the uh, average temperature. Uh, similarly here, you've got a bigger range. We were here for longer during the day. Uh, and you can see the average temperature is cooler. Uh, and on the 30th, the range is short, there's less range in temperature, but uh, the, the, the average is similar to that of the 29th. And then for the light intensity measured by LUX, um, so that's the unit just of light intensity at the site, uh, you can see for the cloudy conditions, very low uh, light intensity. Uh, on the 30th, excuse me, on the 29th, you have a higher light intensity. Um, and then on the 30th, you've got a, a greater range, but on average, you've got a lower light intensity. And if you look at the correlation between the light intensity and air temperature, that's uh, pretty pretty weak, um, really. So this is neat because now we can start to compare air temperature, uh, light intensity, uh, and and the the role of the, the the shielded sensor. Okay, so a couple of results then. So first thing, uh, light intensity changes even within a flight. So what do I mean by that? If we look at this here, so this is June 29th. So at 10:20, at, at 32 seconds past 10:20. 
this is the color of the image that the drone takes and then it moves forward a bit and six seconds later it takes another photograph and then we have the top one here again is june 30th and you can see that these are same area just darker colored so the light conditions differ and if we look at the digital number and that's just a proxy for measuring how much light has been reflected um, from this triangle here, um, higher uh, green or digital number value, so DN is going to be more light reflecting off the area. Um, you can see that in this uh, set in this session here or this this photograph even, uh, you've got a digital number of 101, uh, and then six seconds later, maybe some cloud covers come over, and that's changed the digital numbers, dropped it back. So by dropping back, it's changed the the uh, the in in that short moment of time, it's changed the energy balance. Uh, in that moment so that's going to affect um, what's going on at the sensor <clears throat> and then of course if you look at the 30th it's just much much darker so your digital number almost halves in contrast to what it was on the 29th at uh, 32 seconds past 1020. so that's important just to understand the variability that we can have even within a flight um, with these drones so kind of what's the role then of, of the surface absorptivity so how much um, um, solar irradiance the sensor absorbs What's the role of that with temperature? So just, just really simple things first. So we're going to have a red, green, blue image here. And we have A and B, so different scales, the entire river, and then a really fine scale look here. Um, so we're going to have on this line, we're going to have a, or this to this column here, we're going to have the digital, digital sensor uh, thermal infrared image. So it's going to be this one here, non-shielded. And then we're going to have the shielded uh, thermal infrared sensor in this one here. And you can see that by the uh, by the aluminum covered shield. Uh, and it's funny, I've been in North America too long. We call this aluminium back home, but now I'm saying aluminum. Anyway, all right. So what's the color scheme up here is going to be? We're going to have cool is the blue color, and then uh, the, the yellow or the bright yellow is the uh, is the, is the warm. So first thing. Um, here we can see that we have some boulders in, in the shade, and yes, they're picking them up in the in the sensor that is not shielded, so that's all happy days. Uh, you can see that there's uh, some cold water coming here, and it's actually from the from the stream, which is up uh, the the input of the brook, which is upstream. And here is the brook itself, so you can see the cold water brook coming in here. Uh, here it is here, so that's all good, cool. You can delineate it, uh, and that's great. When you look at the shielded sensor, something comes up really interesting you can see the ripple, the ripples, excuse me. So when you shield it, this is doing nothing else, this is just a raw image, you start to see ripples, you start to see features that you otherwise wouldn't. So the question becomes, why is that? And we'll speak to that in a moment. So why is this shielded sensor picking up riffle, ripples? Excuse me, I'm saying ripples. Why is it picking up ripples? So think about this conceptually for a moment. So we have, uh, we're gonna have shortwave uh, infrared radiation, so that's a solar irradiance. Then we're gonna have some light reflected off it. Um, and if we think about our two sensors now, and we can conceptualize some shortwave infrared radiation coming in, it's a black body. So it's gonna reflect less of it because it's gonna absorb more. However, if we look at the tinfoil one over here, or that we have the same amount of uh, shortwave infrared radiation coming in, but more of it is reflected. So this is gonna change the okay so just pause here for a second so by changing the surface absorptivity we've changed the external heating balance of the sensor so what do i mean by that so these sensors as i said earlier on they they're they are on based on uncooled microbolometers and how this works is it's using the ratio or the relationship between changes in temperature and changes in electrical resistivity and all of that is forced by the uh, infrared radiation hitting the sensor so <clears throat> If we change the signal, or if we change the heating or the thermal conductance within that sensor, we change the relationship between temperature and electrical resist resistivity. So here, the sensor becomes more sensitive to these subtle differentials that we're picking up because the thermal conductance is more stable, or it's or it's it's different than it would be in this instance here. So that's really important. So then, what about the 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 light conditions? So again, here we have June 27th. Bear with me, we, we can walk through this together. So here we have this, uh, the, so the bog standard non-shielded, so the default sensor. And on the y-axis, we have the temperature logger. And then on, on the x-axis, we're gonna have the deviation. So what is the difference between the temperature logger? So, so the gold standard is a temperature logger here, remember. So what's the difference between the temperature logger and what the drone, or the, excuse me, the sensor thinks the temperature is. So we can see here on the 27th, that 
it's it's underestimated temperature by about minus four to minus six degrees Celsius. However, when we have the shielded sensor in here, you can see that it the the, the discrepancy it's not as it's not as it's not as wide. It also that's not the correct thing to say. It, it is still as wide, but it's not as uh, it's not underestimating the temperature as much. There's about a two degree differential here. But what's interesting is is that it's saying it's a bit warmer. It's it's saying the water temperature is a bit warmer than what we're seeing. However, if you look at the 29th now, and um, we can see we still have a, a, it's almost minus six degrees uh, cooler than what is actually there. But when we look at the shielded sensor, it's, it's again about minus four, and we again have this warmer. So again, about maybe five degree differential here, and again, five degrees here, perhaps, but this one is not underestimated as much as this sensor here. And then on the 30th, we have the same kind of story. So this sensor uh, with that's not shielded, just the bog standard one, is underestimated the temperature by almost minus eight, excuse me, minus seven degrees Celsius, whereas this one's about minus five. So even just with shielding the sensor and taking into the light conditions, we can see that there's some differential here. That's a $5, $5 uh, modification you can make to the sensor, and it's giving you more accurate um, measurements. However, we got to go lean into this role of light and air temperature a bit more. So how does changing the surface absorptivity and light conditions impact the sensor's uh, temperature measurements? So here we have standard deviation of all of the data. So this is essentially looking at, on average, it's taking the average of it, what was the comparison of our 132 uh, temperature observations through the time of the study uh, versus what the sensor is saying. And we have the, the unshielded sensor here uh, is the gray panel, and the shielded sensor is the, the blue one here. And on average, the blue one, the, the, div, the deviation is about minus two degrees Celsius versus about minus four. So just by changing that, um, we can see that we've increased the accuracy by about, my, by about two degrees Celsius. That's, that's neat. Then if you look at the deviation, so this is, if we think about precision here, so there's a different, the difference between accuracy and precision, how precise are the measurements, we see that there's no real difference between it. So that's interesting. So the precision doesn't change, but the accuracy does, right? And then if we think about the role of air temperature, um, it, the, the, the relationship is, is the same for both, but in different, with the shielded sensor here, you have more variability explained with air temperature than you do with the unshielded sensor. And we think that's got to do with the energy budget that's actually influencing the microbolometer itself. I'm not gonna go too far down the wormhole in this. If someone has questions after, we can, we can go there. Um, but essentially what it's finding is that as you, um, as you increase the air temperature, you end up with greater errors, which makes sense, right? Because this is an uncooled sensor. If you increase the air temperature, uh, there's an increase in conduction perhaps, and that's he heating up the sensor. And then this is really interesting. So the role of light. So the parabolic relationship is very interesting. So if we just use the light intensity on its own, we explain 40% of the variability uh, in the, the sensor deviation of that shielded sensor. But what's interesting is there seems to be a sweet spot here. So if you look at this point, this point is reflectance of, of this point here. So when we have a light intensity of about 150,000 lux, and then air temperatures of about 16 degrees Celsius, this shielded sensor is getting pretty close to spot on temperatures, right? But we can see then the, the, the um, variance explained by this parabolic relationship for the unshielded sensor, the light intensity is having even a bigger influence. And so what we think here is that as you increase the light intensity, uh, well, I guess that's gonna be the next slide, we go there. So, so why is an increase in light uh, linked to more accurate temperature measurements down here? So if we can conceptualize a few things, all right? So if we increase the shortwave infrared loading the water heats up, okay? Solar radiation is the biggest driver of stream temperature heating. So if we increase the shortwave infrared radiation, the stream heats up. As the stream heats up, if you look at Stefan Boltzmann's law here, the energy flux, so this is the uh, radiated uh, energy, is gonna increase to the power of four. So as you increase the heat energy, this is gonna lead to higher long of infrared um, uh, emitted, and this essentially is what our temperature is measuring. So we're increasing the signal to noise ratio, and therefore we're getting more accurate measurements. So that's what we conceptualize that, that may be totally wrong, but we think that's what's going on here. So 
we can uh, flying in sunny conditions, excuse me, rather than overcast is probably a wise sampling strategy when you're collecting thermal infrared uh, data for, for streams. So we're almost there. There's one more thing. We're going to talk through this next figure together. So this is something that we didn't even think about, and it's something that became apparent in the data. So we're going to start here uh, in A, and we'll work through to F. So here we have a calibrated image. So we have a thermal infrared image. And what we've done is we've taken the stream temperature loggers and we've calibrated it. So the, the R squared of this is about 0 0.9. And I think the root mean squared is about uh, 0 0.6 or something like that. So this is a pretty decent representation of what was going on that day. So the calibrated temperature, uh, 41.9 degrees Celsius to 7.9 is what's been measured. But the sensor that is just the default sensor, uh, it's saying 48.5 to minus 0 0.8. And I was there that day. It was definitely not minus 0 0.8. Um, and then the shielded sensor is kind of getting you to, to more of what we see uh, in this sensor. But it's still uh, underestimating with the 5.1 degrees Celsius. And it overestimates with 50.1 versus 41.9. So let's go over to this image for a moment here. and take this cross section here. And on this cross section, we're gonna look at the temperature of the calibrated image, which is the black line, the uh, shielded sensor, which is the blue line, and then the unshielded sensor, the default sensor, which is the gray line. So if we look at that across this line, so it's starting at zero, moving to 30, we're going out of this tributary into the main stem, you see something really interesting. So here is the temperature from the calibrated image. You come out of the brook, cold brook, and then it goes into the main river, and it gets to about 16. And all of these, all of the, the trends or the, the profiles are identical, but there's a massive difference here. So this one here is about, let's say, 13 degrees Celsius. Uh, the default sensor or the one that you buy out of the box is saying 8 degrees, but our shielded one is saying about 11, 11.5 11 maybe. But when we get into the main river here, our sensor is bang on. It's bang on with what the calibrated image is saying, but this one is still quite a bit off. And here we have a digital number again. So this is the green band. Green is good for um, uh, for light attenuation. Excuse me, it's good, it's good for river bathymetry. So we just chose to select the green band. And here is the amount of uh, ref relative reflected light from the surface or from the riverbed itself, excuse me, from here. If we come down to this image, we see something really interesting. So this is the temperature error so this is these lines minus this calibrated image. And what you can see is as you come out of the brook and then into the main river, even for the default sensor, the error reduces. And then when you look at our sensor, it's about a degree Celsius off here. And when it hits this red line here into the river, the temperature re uh, error reduces and it goes to zero. So what's happening here is that this is this, this high um, digital um, number is a proxy for reflectance. So this is really high reflectance. So reflectance and emissivity have an inverse relationship. So if you have high reflectance, you've got low emissivity. And remember that we're measuring long with infrared radiation. So the color of the riverbed is impacting how accurate our sensors are. So that's going to be really important if you're mapping things at scale. So if you were to perhaps design a, a sampling strategy or, or to put out temperature loggers to kind of calibrate your data, you would ought to think about the color of the riverbed because that seems to be quite important um, in terms of how accurate these sensors can be. OK, so in summary then for part one, changes in surface absorptivity of the sensor reduce thermal drift. Um, considering light and air temperature conditions can also lessen thermal drift. And the role of riverbed emissivity needs future investigation. OK, so this is part two, then. We're going to go into um, um, salmon power. So I, I'm not going to go through the whole behavior from regulation thing. I've, I think it, everyone here knows the score here. So most simply, during extreme summer temperatures, Atlantic salmon are going to use cold water refuges. And these are known as thermal refuges. I'm not speaking about winter here. We're just going to speak about summer. So what does it look like? Um, so this is an image showing uh, underwater a video of a, a salmon power aggregation in 2020. And here is the same area um, when there's no power aggregating. So this is abnormal, and this is kind of normal, right? So you can see that you get really high densities of fish, and it's, it's quite something. <clears throat> 
if you think about the amount of studies that have been done on this, and, and, and we're going to focus on the Southwest Mary Mishi here, it's kind of ground zero for our group anyway. Um, so this is a paper, a lovely paper by Cindy Bro uh, et al. In, 20, in 2007, excuse me. And here you can see water temperature. The black dots are when an ab aggregation was observed, and the clear dots are when there was not one. So the conclusion here was when you have temperatures greater than 24 degrees Celsius, you have an aggregation. However, look, there's there's no aggregations when you get a 26 here. So what is going on? Then we have this follow-up paper from Emily Corey et al. in 2020. And Emily found that in the little Southwest Miramichi, onset temperatures for the first aggregation were about 27 degrees Celsius. So this has me thinking, and Tommy, why is there this variability? Okay, and this kind of leads into this paper that we published last month. So, uh, or it'd be a month and a half ago now, I guess. So, uh, this is a paper, um, uh, the timing and frequency of high temperature events bends the onset of behavioral thermoregulation in Atlantic salmon. So, we conceptualize that there is a thermal hysteresis signal, and this is inherent in the aggregation onset temperature thresholds um, for, for juvenile salmon. So, don't worry, we're going to go into this whole idea about what hysteresis is if folk aren't familiar with it. So what is hysteresis? Most simply, the state of a system is dependent on what has happened to the system in the past and what is happening to it in the, in the present. And we use this quite a lot in physics. So if you think about electromagnetics, or excuse me, magnetics in, in essence, uh, these things follow hysteresis curves. You've got loading and unloading, so saturation and then desaturate, desaturization, if you will, okay? And if we think about um, fish, this is, a real, this is a really nice book by Eckhart et al. So a physiology book, fish physiology. This is in the first chapter, and I thought it was really, really well done. So if we think about hysteresis operating at, at this level, so the atomic level, we can take that and push it into this fish and use the same kind of principles. Well, that's that's the that's the the concept that we've come up with. So that's kind of what we're dealing with here. So again, just to, just to recap, the state hysteresis is the state of a system depends on what has happened to it in the past and what is happening to it in the present. So let's think about this conceptually uh, in a figure or a, or a plot. For those who are engineers, um, physiologists use the word stress uh, differently than I would as an engineer. Um, stress and strain are two different things. They're three by three matrices. Um, so I'm not going to go into that. But for here, we're going to see say strain here is, is equivalent to physiological stress. And if there's any engineers or physicists, we can talk about that down the line. Uh, but for here, we're just going to keep with the nominal feature, not to confuse people. So on this plot, we have on the x-axis strain. And on the y-axis, we're going to have thermal threshold. So the thermal threshold is the temperature at which um, a juvenile salmon will seek thermal refuge. That's going to be key. So if we think about point one here, and we have this curve. So as you increase uh, your strain, um, excuse me, increase the temperature, you're increasing the strain, and this loads up the strain in the fish or the physiological stress. At which point it's gonna hit here, and at this point it cannot take any more stress. So it's gonna seek out a refuge. So at that point here, we have an inflection point. This is when the fish is gonna seek out a thermal refuge. And this could then, if we draw it across here, would be defined as the thermal threshold. So this is a temperature that the fish will go seek out a thermal refuge. And once it's in the refuge, then we have an unloading curve because the temperature is cooler. So the, 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 the strain or the physiological stress will decrease and it's going to be the inverse to this loading curve, right? So that's one thing, but now we, so that, that will be the recovery, if, if you will, if you've got to think, excuse me, think about recovery. So we have a short time since the event or a long time. So maybe we have an event on a Monday, and when I say event here, I'm talking about an aggregation. So if we have an aggregation event on a Monday, and then we have another one on a Wednesday, is, is the temperature threshold that the fish seek out the refuges going to be different between a fish that has experienced stress on a Monday and a Wednesday uh, versus a fish that experienced stress on a Monday and a Sunday, say, right? So different times apart. So we can conceptualize that then. And we can have our loading curve here. Uh, this is the fish uh, gets too stressed. Um, then seeks out thermal refuge and it resets. So what happens then if we have another event, but it's on Wednesday? So the fish hasn't had time to recover. So the onset temperature now is going to be located here on this unloading curve. However, as we increase the amount of time since an event, we, we in essence go back to our baseline thermal threshold, okay? So 
this is what we call the time sense event component of the hysteresis curve, um, or T subscript E. However, we must also consider um, repetitive fatigue, right? So again, same plot here, but this time we invert the loading curve because we're thinking about this in terms of, if we, if we think about time since the event, the inverse of time is one over T, which is frequency. So now we're thinking about how, the, how, how much, excuse me, the, the measure of frequency of events over a window of time. So we have a loading curve, fish goes into the uh, refuge, uh, bang, and now it starts to unload that stress, okay? But again, thinking about this in terms of frequency now, so we have a low frequency and a high frequency. So this is per, per for a window of time. So let's say, well, for our models, we're seeing 11 days is pretty important. So if you increase the number of events in 11 days, that conceptually should decrease the thermal thresholds or the aggregation onset temperatures. So let's think about this. So we have fish is all grand here. Next thing, uh, temperature starts to increase, fish is strained, and then bang seeks a thermal refuge, now you have unloading, okay? So that's the first event, low frequency. Then we have another event in a short window of time, and another, and another, and another. And every time you do this, you're reducing the thermal thresholds, right? So that we call this the frequency of events, all right? So essentially what we end up with is this. So we have a threshold recovery model, so aggregation onset temperature on the y-axis here, and then we have a thermal threshold reduction model or, or event frequency. And then we've got a lambda and omega or, or um, uh, the parameters that we're looking at here. So time sense events, lambda, um, event frequency is omega. So this is what we're looking at. Uh, we can essentially add these together, or integrate, close the loop, happy days. Uh, let's go and test this hypothesis, all right? So, how do we do that? Well, we built these underwater cameras. Now, this is Raspberry Pi. Um, you could, so this actually is, is published now, I should say 2023. Um, so uh, Raspberry Pi Zero, uh, we got this Raspberry Pi camera um, powered by a battery bank, uh, and then we just put it in the river, uh, revisit it every seven days. Um, great. 2021 um, starts to get lazy. We get lazy, of course, and we're trying to become more efficient. Also, gas prices are going up. So we went into these Brino uh, cameras, time-lapse, uh, really great, last about two to three weeks in the river. You got to worry about biofilm, so service it every two weeks or so. Uh, and Bob's your uncle, very good, okay, great. So we use the 2021 data to develop our models, and then we can test this against 2020. So the rationale that Tommy and I had behind that was that 2020 can't influence the past. So if we build our conceptual models here and our, 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 excuse me, our model coefficients here, we can test it against the past because the past has not been influenced by the future, unless it's Terminator, which I don't think it, the fish are. So this is a really solid way to test the validity and the credence of this temperature model, or excuse me, this, this, this model we're talking about. Okay, so we are on um, 2020, we had cameras here in Parksbrook. 2021, we had them in Otterbrook. We also had them in Parksbrook in 2021, but we had a massive hurricane come through and, and put a meter of grab on top of our cameras that were here. So this is why we're comparing just uh, Otter and Parks. Uh, just for instance, or um, example though, that the main stem temperature differences are not very much. They're within about uh, 0.5 degrees Celsius. So this is where Parks Brook is. Here's where Otter Brook is. So these are relatively comparable sites. And here's what the thermal uh, refuges look like. So here we have Parks, very, very different than Otter Brook. So we have two cameras facing in. We have a temperature logger in the main river here, and we have a temperature logger in the plume, which after another paper we published, the, the plume temperatures is kind of, I wouldn't recommend it. It's, it's too dynamic in here. If you have a logger in the brook here, it might be better. Anyway, so we have a main temperature logger here and a main temperature logger here. Same idea, flow direction this way, flow direction this way, and two cameras. All right, so here's the nuts and bolts of it. But we're gonna work through this together. So here we have the recovery model. And what you can see is the, the gray dots are 2020, and this is the test data. And the black dots are what we've built the, the timing, um, excuse me, uh, the training data on. Let's get my cursor there. So you can see that there's a pretty decent relationship um, between them and it, and it is, um, it's logarithmic. So when you plot this up, you get a, an adjusted R squared for the training data of 0 0.57 and a root mean squared error of, the, uh, of 0 0.6 degrees Celsius. Main thing here is you can see the differentials in the onset aggregation temperatures you go from 24 to 27. 
So this clearly shows that the temperature thresholds are not static, they're dynamic through time. So that's really important. Further, what we see is that when we have the, um, uh, when we uh, test this data um, against that 2020 data set, the, the ability for the model to explain the variance drops quite a bit. It drops to 0 0.38 and, and the root mean square is of drops to 0 0.5. However, when we look at the frequency model, so if you have high frequency events, and here, sorry, I said 11 days earlier on, it's actually 14 day window. As you increase the number of events here, so you can see omega here, that's just the number of events divided by 14, you end up seeing a really tight relationship and you can see that here in the predictions, right? So here are the, the, the training data is the black dots, and then 2020, the test data are the gray dots. And you can see that you explain about 89% of the variance um, with a root mean scale of about 0 0.3 degrees Celsius in the training data set. And it remains relatively strong just with that one parameter, uh, about 0 0.69 degree, or excuse me, R squared of 0 0.69 with a root mean squared error that's identical to the training one. So that's that's really quite something to think about. Oh, sorry, <laughs> getting ahead of myself. So when we integrate these models then, this is where we see something really nice. So, okay, you may say here, well, this hasn't increased the power of it very much in terms of the, the one parameter model, so this is a two parameter model, but the root mean squared error has dropped and the transferability to the next season is increases. So the root mean squared error uh, is the same in both models, but the amount of variance explained in that year that we did not see, did not, uh, um, let's see, the year that we were testing the model against, it does really well with it. So a couple of things then, the threshold recovery model is quite poor. Why is this? Well, uh, these the summers are gonna differentiate, so the thermal regimes differ through time. So that's maybe something that could be going on here. The thermal refuge temperatures are different, that it may also be going on. Here. So th this is more complex than what we're representing here, and we're abundantly aware of that, but it's something to, um, to consider. Further, um, the threshold reduction model appears to be transferable across time, uh, so that's really interesting. Um, and then, quite simply, the underwater cameras, this UWC, uh, can provide high temporal resolution, passive information on fish, and it's applicable in remote locations. Okay, so just for way of summary then for part two, underwater cameras are an efficient tool for thermal refuge studies. The thermal thresholds that initiate thermal aggregation responses, um, this shouldn't be in adults here, that's a typo, excuse me, uh, is not static, right? So that should not be adults, that's a typo, I, I apologize for that. And then um, the management strategies ought to account for such variance, all right? So I just wanna thank uh, co-authors, field techs, and lab managers. Um, I'm quite lucky to work with such a great group of people and uh, thank you to our funders and supporters. Of course, ASCF have been really good to us. Um, and if you guys have any questions, I'll try and answer them. Uh, thanks, uh, Anton, for that presentation. Um, I wasn't ready, ready with my button to unmute myself there. <laughs> um, we are now uh, ready for some questions and answers. Um, if you want to ask your question out loud, uh, please bring it I will unmute you and if you want to type it in I can read it out loud so uh, I'm going to check here to see if we have any any questions give you guys a minute we do have one uh, let's see so if you can unmute yourself uh, Gavin go right ahead there we go, perfect. Yeah, I was just trying to get past the, the unmuted lock there button. Hey, Antoine, how you doing? Uh, great presentation. Um, I just had a question. I think we've talked about this previously as well, but have you noticed uh, a difference between juveniles and adult salmon and, and, and that kind of aggregation? Is, is there a difference between temperatures, I guess, between adults and, and juveniles? Oh yeah, this is well known. Yeah, adults will go lower temperature than juveniles. Yeah, um, that that's that's pretty well known. Yeah, so adult uh, salmon will go at much lower temperatures than juveniles, and even with juveniles, there's differences across age classes. So, for instance, um, um, 2010, Emily Corey saw uh, young of the year aggregating, and it was very very warm, about 30.5 degrees Celsius, and that wasn't seen before, I don't think. Um, and then in 2021, we also saw uh, young of the year aggregating, that was 31.5. 
Um, but in general, uh, juvenile salmon, uh, there's a differential in, in the thresholds through age classes. So one to two seem to be quite similar, or one plus and two plus, but um, for adult salmon, it's going to be very diff diff it's very different. And it's also, they're very difficult to study because their behaviors are very different than juveniles and they're moving through the system. So uh, the adults are quite complicated. Yeah. yeah. Do the, do, so I've seen, you've shown me photos of, of the adult kind of following that outflow of like a cold water tributary. Do the juveniles mm -hmm. kind of act in that way as well? Or, or is it more like they just kind of uh, spread themselves out amongst their desirable habitat, which would be like, you know, like a riffle or a, um, yeah. No, so yeah, so the, the, they will use this, the refuge the same way um, as adults. And uh, my, my honor student, Alex, Alex Morgan, published a paper about this stuff in, um, uh, in November. And, and so the position that the, that the age class is huge in, in, the, in the refuge uh, is differentiates by age class in essence. So you have um, bigger fish are occupying the coldest areas or the areas that are most bioenergetically efficient. Um, and then you have younger age classes kind of fall in behind it. Um, kind of the big fish gets the best spot kind of thing. But the juveniles will will also use the refuges like the adults do, yeah. Perfect, thank you. All right. Thanks for your question. Is there any more questions? Okay, we do have one that got typed in. Um, could sampling at night reduce variability between camera and logger measurements? So for the infrared sensor? In part one of your presentation? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it depends how much, well, it depends upon what you're trying to get. So again, like I'm not, it depends what your question is, I guess. Um, that's a good question because you would be getting radiated energy off the river. Yeah, that would be interesting. But I don't know if you're actually allowed to fly the drones at nighttime. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. That's a good question. But I, I would question then what's the what's the aim of doing that, right? So why would you need accurate temperature measurements in the nighttime? Um, well, it's it, it, actually the nighttime is quite important. Let's be honest about it. Fish are in the river at nighttime too. So I guess it just depends on the question, but that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you. Um, Craig Purchase, did you have a question? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for that stuff. It's nice to always see something that you haven't got a clue about. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't have a clue about any of this. The, no, uh, no, no, nor do I. You're good. <laughs> well, I, uh, but... My, somewhat related to that so how far away are we you know in time or what would be the, like if a group or an individual wanted to look for thermal refuges like you like these streams you had flowing in and so even if the absolute values are not totally accurate but it's easy to detect a gradient as an example like yeah. you should like if someone wanted to survey their watershed and find out if there were thermal refuges somewhere like What's the cost of one of these units, or what is the knowledge gap for someone if they had one to be actually just to identify a spot where there's cold water? So there's so you're from Newfoundland, I'm assuming, right? I am. Okay, so there's ways to skin this cat. So uh, most simply, this this stuff is very well established in the remote sensing world. So there's a guy, Christian Torgensen, um, back probably the mid to late 90s kind of mastered this stuff and then there's been a trove of papers looking at whole catchments have been mapped with this right um it's expensive though um cost wise uh we got it done and we provided a helicopter uh, back in 2008 i wasn't here i used to be a bartender so i was bartending in 2008 but um they were looking at about 250 to 300 bucks a kilometer um but if you and that's with the helicopter supplied so if you're if you're going after a helicopter, then you're hiring a consultant to do it. You're, you're well, looking I, at- I was thinking a drone with a drone like you used. Yeah, so the drone, you get about a kilometer on the drone and then your battery life on it, you might get 40 minutes out of some now, but even with that, you're beyond line of sight. So you have to get a specialized license for that. Uh, people have done it. There's a, there's a, there's a girl, um, uh, uh, Roster, she did it in Australia. But so the thing with this is if you could, you could for sure do it. You could for sure do it, but it would take an awful amount of work. Mm. And then if you, so if you're in Newfoundland though, you got to think, so rivers that are groundwater influenced don't freeze in the winter. 
So you could look at winter satellite images, and if they're not frozen, well, then you can say, well, geez, that's a groundwater spot, eh? Yeah, well, that's, there's not much ground. Like you could say, uh, so I've just been participating in the Newfoundland DFO salmon assessments things for two days, and we were talking about this this morning, coincidentally. So, for example, you know, in places south of us uh, that have a hotter climate, you only really get salmon where there are cool refuges. But in, yeah. in Newfoundland, we have salmon everywhere, but they they won't be everywhere if it continues to warm up because many of the places where they are, they're just on granite bedrock and they're no, they're presumably, I would think, but I don't know, for example, that uh, we find salmon in lots of places in Newfoundland that you would not find them in central New Brunswick, as an example. I, um, yeah, I think, I think you're right. <laughs> but whether that's gonna persist into the future, I don't know. So for example, I had bloggers in a watershed this year and we calculated out this morning that 40% of July and August, it was above 24 degrees. Um, right. I mean, this, and we're not aware that there's any cold refuges, but this is kind of what I was getting at. If there was a, other than a helicopter, if even if it cost tens of thousands of dollars for a drone in time to actually try to find some of these things. But at tens of thousands of dollars, you're better off going a helicopter route because you cover, you get an old whole catchment done in a couple of days, right? Yeah, okay. Sorry, that's probably not the answer you wanted there. Well, I just I said I didn't know anything about this, so I was yeah. just trying to. It no, sounds, no, it yeah. sounds like it's too hard, which is what I thought. <laughs> it's not too hard. No, I mean, it, I I don't think it's too hard. It depends on how hard you want to work. That's the difference. So, like, I mean, yeah. You can also give me an email if you want to talk about this further, man. You can give me a shout. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Greg. And I don't see any other questions coming in. And so, oh, we do have a hand raised here. You're not uh, not done yet. Go on, Liam. You are unmuted. Liam McNeil. Must have. Um, I do have another one while we're waiting for Liam to try to. He is unmuted on my end, but uh, something must not be working. I do have a written question. Um, did you create any ortho mosaics with your thermal imagery? Yeah, it's all ortho mosaic. The whole thing is, yeah. So, so just so, so folk know, so when you stitch those images together, that's what ortho mosaic is. You stitch them together, and then from that stitched image, you apply some um, some other equations to change the emissivity values over to actual temperature measurements. But it has to be a, um, a radiated radiative image. So, if you're ever buying a drone, make sure that it says R JPEG or something like that. Otherwise, it's not going to give you temperature. Okay. So, Liam, did you want to try again? Okay. We Reverse. Do... <laughs> well, if you can... Hello. Hello. Luck? Hello. Hello. Is that Liam? <laughs> Liam? Yes, it is Liam. Hi, Anton. How are you? Hey, man. How are you? Jeez, it's good to hear from you. Hi, it's good to see you. Um, I have uh, I have a couple questions about part one. Uh, the first is a really simple one, which is, has the word got back to any of the manufacturers that they should actually fabricate these in lighter colors? Uh, I I haven't. Somebody else can if they want. <laughs> um, it's funny, yeah. It's it's funny though. I, I guess they're I guess they're when they're manufacturing them, it's more for search and rescue, so you don't need absolute temperatures, so they're not thinking in those realms. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, the second one is actually uh, still on part one, which is that um, there's a there's a substantial difference uh, in I think you said reflectance in the trib versus the main stem. So mm -hmm. it's a little more reliable in the main stem was kind of the the sum yes. of that. Right? Yes. And um, so that obviously that's a function of color. Isn't isn't that also just a function of the turbidity? And really, you could just see it was depth. 
as the kind of one variable that's really well you can you can really use depth because the light attenuation is going to differ dependent on the color of their bed right yeah. so if you think about depth um if you've got a really dark bed the light is going to be absorbed and attenuated differently it's, it, it decays as an exponential going through the water so yeah. if you have a really bright bed and you have low turbidity you're correct on that well then depth is not the proxy you can use so for instance the rest of is very very clear so um gin clear water and um, so at three meters there you may have the same visibility like secchi depth that you would have in the mirror machine which is tannic at maybe a meter so you got to think and it's, it's it's a very it's a hard question because typically when we think of thermal infrared we're talking about the skim of the surface a um, couple of microns but now we're seeing well there's also energy radiating from the bed itself so it's not something that we were considering well i certainly wasn't anyway <laughs> so yeah um, I just have one more question um, because I'm still working with marine realms. So I usually say I'm trying to trying to come into the ocean and learn how to walk. Um, right on. Is um, uh, actually just a, a basic question. What what are the actual data file size requirements you're working with to develop these? Uh, even for I don't know something a small case study like you were like you were showing. Is it is it hundreds of gigs, tens of gigs? No, it wouldn't be hundreds. Um, it depends. So the, the thermal infrared imagery is only one band. And it's not very, so we have a 19 mil camera on that, a couple of hundred megabytes for that size. But then when you get into the RGB stuff, and then we have hyperspectral here as well, then when you add more bands into it, you start to really, really get into high energy um, data sets. So for mm -hmm. instance, I have a master student using hyperspec, and he's, you're looking at hundreds of gigabytes for his stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have some other questions that are some basic data and stuff but i'll probably send you an email awesome you man time. it's good hearing from you hope you're doing well yeah you as well all right take care dude well thank you uh, we just have a uh, a quick comment here at the end we have uh julian about uh from the shiat bay watershed uh, i guess it's part of their plans for 2023 to do thermal drone surveys so mm -hmm. and mentioning that there's probably some organizations in newfoundland that could do the same work there uh, so I just wanted to uh, read what her, she wanted to share. Uh, cool. Apart from that, I don't see any more hands raised, Anton. So if, All right. for those folks that think of something later on, I'm sure you wouldn't mind if they send us a, the questions via email and we'll Not at all. No. Best to send them an answer and, and get back to them. So yep. thank you very much, uh, Anton. All right presenting us for starting the series and uh, <laughs> kind of bringing us to a close. We do have one more here coming up on March uh, 29th, uh, which is Brian Cobell, and he's going to be talking on the importance of angler surveys, uh, managing New Brunswick fisheries together, uh, which is a little different, and looking forward to that presentation, and that'll be the end of our series uh, after that one. So I'm hoping everybody will join us on the 29th, and once again, Thank you for all those that came to uh, listen to the presentation today and for Anton for sharing the information and uh, wishing you well. So, all right. Take care, Charlene. Have a lovely week. You too. All right. Okay, bye bye.